All right, family, and we are live. Peace and power, and welcome to Tea Talk with the Sisterhood. We meet every Wednesday from 1 p.m. I want to say till 2 p.m., but I'm going to say until, you know, because sometimes the dialogue is so good that we don't want to disconnect. So we try to keep it at an hour. We're going to try to keep it at an hour today, but sometimes, you know, the dialogue, again, is so good that it, it spills over. Um, so we meet every Wednesday from 1 p.m. until to discuss issues that are on the mind of the sisterhood. And each week, I'm telling you, is a panel of sisters that meet and we just chop it up and talk about and talk about a, a plethora of things. So before we get started, I would love all of the sisters to introduce themselves to the viewers. All right, well, peace and love, family. This is your sister, Raziki Zafira, uh, your favorite sacred sex expert and half owner of Nature's Crown International. Peace and love, family. Salima Njai, Arthur of Perceptions of the Misplaced African, Volume 1, available now, Amazon and Kindle. Hope you guys enjoy the show. Hello, this is Cheryl Stevenson. Um, I do government contracting. You can also contact me at stevensonbusinesssolutions.com. Hey everybody, it's Mo, Monica with Tri-City Visionaries. Um, if you're trying to reach me, email is tricityv at gmail.com. Or as you know, I hang out with the Dagger Squad, Dagger Squad 1 at gmail.com. And we help out with, um, well, the focus right now in the summer, so I'm going to have to talk in a moment because I do so much, is we're getting ready to help train young people on how to complete budgets, um, program budgets, and cost analysis. And so far, we have a training going on on Tuesday nights and Sunday nights at 7 p.m. So if you're interested, here's up on Eventbrite. Search program budgets and cost analysis to see my nice little cute, cute little picture, and you can sign up. Mm -hmm. Peace. Peace, family. Kia. I don't really have much to say. Other half of nature's crown. Let's get this discussion going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And peace and power, family. My name is Sister Dr. Oya Ma'at. I am the co-founder and co-president of Ed Anime Productions. And we create educational animations for children. Uh, particularly, you know, children of color. And we have a series entitled Meltrek uh, that is dedicated to teaching children um, African history from an African perspective. We have, right now, we have two episodes available, Meltrek episode one, exploring the ancient Africa, exploring ancient Africa. And we also have uh, Meltrek episode two, now available. Uh, and uh, the name of that one is called Exploring the Pre-Columbian America. So you can visit edanimeproductions.com to purchase your copy of Mel Trek. Uh, before we get started, let's pay homage to the ancestors. We always open up with paying homage to the ancestors because we understand that we are our ancestors and we stand on their shoulders. And it's from them that we draw strength, courage and wisdom. So one, there, let's, let's go down the road. And just, you know, name an ancestor, a female ancestor. She could be in your direct lineage or, or not in your direct lineage that, that really impacted your life. And when we call her name, just please respond with our shade. So let's start with you, Sister Cheryl, and like go down the panel and just name an ancestor, a female ancestor that you would love to acknowledge at this time. Gertrude Harris. Ashay. 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 Sister Wakisho. Uh Maybell McCray. Ashay. Ashay. Okay. And Ashay. Madam CJ Madam CJ Walker. Ashay. 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 Sister Alima. Um Elizabeth Everett. Ashay. Ashay. Bessie Coleman. Ashay. 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 Maya Angelou. Ashay. 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 Sister Monica. Luella Forbes. Ashay. 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 
Right. Ashe. 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 And all of the women of the Dahomey Amazons. I say. Now, wait a minute. Asada Shakur passed? Oh, you know Tupac. what? No, no but. It's Tupac Mom. Afini oh, wait. No, she... Afini. Afini. Afini Shakur. Yeah. That's my fault. You're right. Thank you. All right. Afini Shakur. I say. I say. Uh, Myrtle Bailey. I say. I say. I say. Evelina McFadden. Ashe. Ashe. And I don't know my cousin's grandmother's last name, but she just transitioned on um, May the 5th. And, uh, you know, I've known her for the last 20 years, but I, I, I don't know her last name. So I'm just going to say um, Grandma Shirley. Um, okay. I just, I see. Yeah, she just became an ancestor about five days ago. And so I definitely want to acknowledge acknowledge that strong warrior queen. Um, but we had, we're in store. I mean, this is going to be a great discussion today. We're going to be talking about why are so many black people single? I mean, a lot of black people are single. I mean, I have a lot of male friends who are single. I have a lot of female friends who are single. So the question is, why are so, well, the topic of discussion uh, for today is why are so many black people single? Um, but before we get into that topic, are there any hot topics that you guys uh, want to talk about? I know Sister Alima was just at a festival. Sister Monica just had like a conference. Um, there's something that I want to touch on. So can you guys, you know, to me, to me, those are hot topics. Like Sister Alima, I want to know what happened at the festival. I saw some pictures on your husband's page, you know, at the Aku, I think it's Akumalu. Um, so tell us how that went down. Like what happened yeah, at the, the festival? Aquamalu festival was a really beautiful experience. I'm very glad that we were able to go and take the children and we got to meet our ancestor from the past and we got to build and we got to take part in the sacrifice of the bull. And it, it just really, it's something that I can't even put into words. It's just an experience that I had to have, and I'm really glad that I did, and I really feel that it brought us closer as a family, you know, mm. to get down to African culture and to be a part of that, our culture and our lineage and what we've always done. It just feels so real and just feels so right, and I would just say anybody who is seeking, you know, spirituality, that maybe you would like to join and come next year, you know, and it's down in Gainesville, Florida, three-day festival. And it's just, it's just really, really beautiful. Like, really. Can't tell you everything, <laughs> but it's really I got you. I got you. Great. I got you. Oh, man, that sounds beautiful. I'm actually a little, little jealous, it's man. Okay, you can come next year, sis. Yes, and, I, and I'm going to plan for it. And like you said, bring the kids, bring the family, you know, because I want them to experience that, you know. Yes, I want to bring I'm, my mom and dad next year because I really, especially my mom, I really, really want to bring her so she can get some spiritual healing, you know. Yes. And and I know that you guys are also planning a trip down to the African village down in South Carolina. Is that did you are you guys going to that soon or we'll try and see if we can make it down to Oya Tunji in South Carolina. But anyone if you live in South Carolina in the listening area, you might want to stop by and check it out. You know, it's an official African temple that's been dubbed official by Nigeria and you know you can get a lot of culture and really learn a lot there and there's a lot of different ceremonies initiations for your children and things like that so if you want to check it out family it's in Oya Tunji oh man South Carolina excellent he says it's called Oya Tunji yes Oya Tunji oh, yeah. in South Carolina yes yes excellent and, and you said they have a lot of like ceremonies and stuff like that I was just wondering if they had like a rites of passage program they do. They do. They have different Ooh, things for okay, boys. Okay. And I, I want to get something done for Ziggy. And so if you go uh, onto the website, I will get the name, the link of the website by the time um, before we get off. But you can yes, the website please, to tell you all about it and everything that they offer and everything. Please, sis, post it in the uh, group chat and also post it 
you know, for the, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the regular chat, you know, okay. for the, for the, that's hot. Like I, you know, I, I would really love to send um, Isaiah and Harvey uh, who are both what 17 and 18, you know, down to a rice of passage. My sister Riziki would really, really love it. I know she would. Ooh. Really? Wow. Okay. And that's what I was saying before. I'm, I'm glad to hear a, a good review and you know, I don't like to shed negative light, but, and I'm assuming things change, but some of the women, and I don't know if maybe they were just on another or whatever, but it was just negative stuff to say. And I was just like, oh, wow. heartbroken. Like when I looked at the videos, Okay, wait, but go ahead. I want to. I want to hear your perspective on why you would feel I, I want. I would like it. You just you seem wondering. to me to be a very in tune sister and a very spiritual oh, yeah. sister, and you seem to be yeah. open to different aspects of spirituality and even just just to ex experience something different. I just feel that you yeah. definitely, you know, you would really enjoy it. And what part of South Carolina? I'll look it up. But yeah, now that now that you brought it back up, I, I'll definitely look into going because. Uh, yeah, I, it's good for us to know where we can go experience culture on American soil. You that's know, right. a lot of people may not be able to travel in, internationally. So that's, that's right. That's hot. And and then Sister Monique, I know that you just had a conference like maybe a couple of weeks ago in South Carolina. How did that go for you? It was I think it was last. I know it was a couple of weeks ago. I believe. Yes. Yes, we just had a financially focused forum. And we invited down Mr. Ivy Stokes, who is a co-founder of My Econ, which is a personal financial management company. We also had Sister Cheryl, who talked about the government contracts. And we had Garfield Reed, who spoke in reference to the Z Black card and trade lines. It was very successful. We had 75 people who attended, uh, were patronized well, as they stated. And everybody seemed to have a, a very good time. We had a very good response from that event in that we did something different. We tried to walk an actual either idea on how to make money without having any money at all. And on a personal level, how to actually, if you are an employee, a w, what we call a W-2 employee, I mean, by properly completing your W-4s and using those um, funds back from your federal taxes and doing what we call income shifting and paying off debt and then investing in cash producing assets. Uh, one of the one of the unique things that we added to the event is that we bought IRS agents to speak to businesses in reference to do's and don'ts of owning a home based business or filing taxes and what are some um, tax deductions that you can capture from it. and what is the proper documentation necessary for those filings? There are different apps that you can use to track mileage. Um, the one tax deduction that I had to start getting on was the volunteer. That when you're going to these different places and you're volunteering, regardless of what it is, to capture the mileage because solid and mileage document your mileage on your actual uh, business taxes, which actually helps out. The other thing was taking pictures. When you're going to different places, get in the habit of taking pictures that is document proof, and the old-fashioned way is writing it down. So that was outstanding. Everybody had a good time. We had um, Sean P. from the Sheshmeta my, my group came down with his family and his kids. Unc from the Amirat Squad was there as well, and all of us to the Atanji village. <laughs> Which is about yes, um, we did. <laughs> which was about an hour and forty-five minutes away from Columbia. It's a little bit outside of Beaufort, South Carolina, and um, I didn't get to walk uh, Garfield and Sean P. and my friend Chanisa and um, Siobhan and all of them and the kids as well. They got to walk around um, and got got a tour. And Cheryl stayed with me because you know I have a knee injury, so I couldn't do a lot of walking. But they have footage, Sean P has footage on his page as well as Garfield. They live streamed the entire thing. Uh, what I gathered, uh, which was unique, was that they do take care of their own. They are, they, they do grow from a sovereign perspective, so they kind of live off the grid, but it's, it's not off the grid to where it, it, they're unattainable. It's right off the road 
Um, so it's a, it's a land. I forgot how many acres of land it is. They have their own rice farms and they make their own money. I know one of the ways, because one of my concerns was how do you really survive? Like how do you, because they do use electricity, things of that nature, but they uh, they throw events there to, to raise their money. And there's, they have time periods where you can actually come in and tour. At the time that we went, the chief was not there. Um, a lot of the elders were, were not there. Who were from one that who was there, um, and they and they toured around. So Sean P and Garfield, them, they they could give you a better idea of what they saw, and um, they, they seem to have a, had a, have had a great experience there. Um, prior to going, I think I think we had some communications about some mishap of the village as well, but we went in and um, and spoke to the individuals who were there and go in there doing no fact checking or anything like that. We just went to experience how it was. We went at a latter part of the day. So it was it was we probably had this to an hour daylight time and it was starting to get dark because we went after the event was over. Um but in, when you when you arrive you can see the you know the sign it clearly states that it's an African village there um do's and don'ts on the front and I think the only thing that I was, when I when I when I think about the villages or or um, groups of cultures living off to their own, I always wonder about uh, infrastructure. I know there we had just come out of another uh, storm, flood storm, and they had a lot of damages from the the 2015 flood that were that um, have not been addressed. Yet, so I always wonder, like, do they ever can they ever get enough revenue to help fix the infrastructure, um, to get them back to where they were, um, and so I always have a concern about that. And how could could you actually yeah. with that without, you know, if you don't, you can't reach for government assistance. I'm not really sure how it works from their structured as a government, but from uh you know, people who are maybe affiliated with them, if that's something they can reach out and help them with. Because I thought the infrastructure, based on the storm and what it did to the land, that they could use some help. Yeah, it was a little broken down, a little, you know, definitely needed to, some upgrades a little bit. But it wasn't even nothing that maybe some pain and little stuff, you know, could have made it look just a little bit more presentable. But um, it was a different experience. Mm. Mm. Sister Raziki, hot topics. Any hot topics, sis? Okay, well, um, as far as hot topics, I'm turning 33 on the 18th. Hey! Okay, that's, that's all I got. Uh, uh, no, oh, um, well, my hot topic is because I know I just talked to you about moving forward, I want to talk about works that. Uh, we're doing and works of other great people, but I want to give you a shout out for coming down to Atlanta and visiting the Apex Museum and the uh, um, Learning Tree. You know, it was a good turnout being able to show the Mail Check DVD, and you know, it was cool to see all the little children and, and what they learned and everything. Oh, thanks. And I really don't, yeah, and I'll also big shout out to Monica and Cheryl again, working with them to start our. A venture in um, government contracting, so that's underway. Um, and and I don't know, that's just my hot topic. Like, I, I guess I have nothing. <laughs> that, that was that, that was actually a lot just now. You like look, really <laughs> you like shout out to the sisters, you know, that are doing their thing. You know, that was yeah. actually a, you had a whole lot. Oh, 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 and big shout out, and I'm so upset that I'm going to miss this. Um, no pseudo tour. Yeah, the no pseudo tour. Yeah, yeah. So oh, that's going God. down in Atlanta. So if y'all are in Atlanta, definitely go check that out. I made it clear I'm still going to be into my tantra and my kundalini and my sidereal astrology, but it don't mean I can't learn something new. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I'm excited definitely. and I hope the brothers can. Yeah, I hope the brothers can record it because I, I definitely would love to hear just, you know, perspective and, and factual information. You know what I mean? So I'm excited. I'll be yes. excited if they let me put the camera on. I will. 
Yeah, I was going to. I told him I'll find a DVD if y'all make one because I, I definitely want to hear, you know, like everybody's experience and their knowledge and their research. I mean, we, we really got to start coming to more of these forums. And you know what? Uh, another thing is, oh, sis, when we visited the church um, when you were down here and how we were talking about, you know, everybody coming into the churches to congregate. And you know what I mean? Like when we was at Dr. Martin Luther King's church, and um, having a friend who's also a pastor, but he, he was just recollecting on how, like, the churches was a meeting space. You know, it wasn't always about religion, but we used, you know, the churches or libraries or whatever to come together and talk about community issues and find out solutions. So, yeah, the, the, I, I had a very I insightful week. I, I agree 100% with you. Like, the church was a, a think tank at one point in time. You know, you would come to the church and you would talk, like you said, discuss community issues and come up with solutions. It was a think tank. Now, today is a big you go to church, you have someone preach to you, you put money in a plate, you leave and nothing absolutely is changing in your life. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I mean, I'm just speaking from my experience. You go, you go, you listen to what they call the word. You know, you try to apply whatever message the pastor gives you that, you know, throughout the week. But you just really don't see anything changing in your life or changing in the, li the lives of people around you. And that just wasn't the case back in the day. You know, with church, it was a movement. And, um, you know, right now, you know, the, the church used to be at the front of the movement, you know, but not right now. Right. Today, today is a, it's, it's a business. But um, I really enjoyed myself at, um, at in Atlanta on uh, this this past weekend. Shout out to the Listening Tree Bookstore uh, for opening their home. I call it their home. It's a house, actually. Um, it's not really a house, but, you know, metaphorically, it's a house um, that they that they built for Black children to come and just be themselves and learn about themselves and love themselves. Beautiful spot. Husband and wife team. They've been in business for like two or three years. Uh, uh, oh, my God. I forgot his wife's name, but I know the, the husband's name is Omar Finley. Oh, and I yeah. think his wife's name is Kimberly Finley. But I mean, they welcomed me with, I mean, they welcomed me with open arms. Event, like Sister Riziki said, just watching the children light up and, you know, seeing themselves in the cartoon. And then when we did a Q&A, they answered every question that I asked. I mean, I couldn't stop them for anything in the world. So they retained, not only were they engaged, you know, and captivated by the animation, they retained the information. You know, they, they processed it, they internalized it you know, and was able to even regurgitate it, you know, when, when called upon. So, um, you know, shout out to the Listening Tree Bookstore. I also want to salute the Apex Museum. Uh, the museum supervisor, Ms. Janice, phoned me on, on Thursday while I was in the airport. And she's like, look, uh, she's like, am I speaking to Dr. My eye? And I said, yes. She said, I'm interested in carrying, uh, we're interested in carrying uh, the Meltrek products. And I said, well, where are you guys based? She said, we're based in Atlanta. I said, wow, I'm actually in an airport headed to Atlanta. So I said, I'll stop past uh, your museum tomorrow. And I met with them on Friday. They took me on a tour of the museum. Um, if you're in the Atlanta area or you plan on visiting the Atlanta area, please go past the Apex Museum. It's a beautiful museum that was built by a brother um, by the name of Dan Moore. And um, he built this museum to preserve African history and to teach African history again from the African perspective. And, um, you know, please go past there, visit them, patronize the museum shop and even donate to them online because they were explaining to me that they were struggling, you know, with funding. And, you know, the last thing we want is for places like the Apex Museum or places like the Listening, Book, the Listening Tree Bookstore to close. So we got to really start mm -hmm. supporting um, our own. And um, so anyway, I, I don't even want to get on that because that'll be a whole nother show in itself. Just the importance of supporting our own and making that a cultural practice. And see, that's the difference between our culture and the other cultures. It's a cultural practice for them to spend their money with people who look like them. It is not a cultural practice for black people to spend their money with black people, but we need to make it a cultural practice. And I always say that we need to advocate, you know, we have all these different reforms, you know, education reform and women. And all. We need to have a cultural uh, reform, 
right now. We need to usher in a whole new mentality, you know, in order to revitalize, you know, our communities. But anyway, let's move on. Oh, before we move on to the, to the topic, I did want to um, ask you, sisters, if you saw the picture that went viral online uh, of the preschool teacher, it was a European preschool teacher, she was dragging, you know, a preschooler, little boy, uh, down the hallway like he was a rag doll. And uh, I know that she's been fired. I was reading in the Philadelphia Gazette that she's been terminated. But, um, you know, it was she kind of just, I don't want to say she manhandled him, but she's dragging this kid down the hallway. Did anyone catch a whiff of the story or had a chance to see the picture? I didn't even know. I have never heard I, of it. Yeah, I saw it. It was awful. I, I just, well, that's on the heels of uh, the other teacher cutting a little girl braids out of her head. Mm. You know, did y'all see that one too? Because that's, it, it all happened in the same yeah, week. That was like 2009. I don't know. I, I guess the story just resurfaced, unless that's something brand new that just duplicated. I thought it was brand new because it's uh, maybe it resurfaced. I don't know, but I saw it with the girl with the little beads in her head. Yeah, it looked like the same little girl from 2009. Wow. Oh, okay. I wonder why it resurfaced. I thought it all happened in the same week. Wow. Well, I know that the, the 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 woman who drugged the little boy, the preschooler down the hallway, this just happened like a few days ago. Um, I want to say mm. in Ohio um, that, that this took place. Uh, you know, you could type in Ohio teacher, you know, drags preschool or something like that. So I know that this just happened. And um, people ask me my thoughts about it. And I'm going to write a Facebook post on it. But we need to get our kids out of their schools. I'm so at a point, I'm so at a point where I feel like it's time for us to put up or shut up. I'm tired of the complaining, yep. I'm tired of marching, I'm tired of the what we need to do. What are we going to do and let's do it? You know, that's that's where I am right now. We complain about the school curriculum and we know that they're teaching racism and white supremacy in the school curriculum, but that doesn't stop you every morning for taking your child to school. I mean, you, you get what I'm saying? We know what they're doing. Yeah, we have prison pipeline. Right, we know stuff. do you know what was the results to the lady who who tried to homeschool it schooling in New York? No, I heard about that sister. I don't know what happened. I know a lot of people like put up raise money for her attorney and raise money. I think to get out on bail. But I need to really research that case because I'm wondering. I remember she got arrested. Yeah. But I don't know what the charges were or what happened. Like, I don't know the backstory. Did you did you hear anything about that, Sister, Sister Monique or Sister Alima, the sister in New York? No, I haven't heard any updates on it. So I'm like Sister Monique and you. I'm, I'm curious to know uh, what happened. Yeah, because, yeah, um, you know, I was definitely researching uh, the homeschooling. Um, and then when that happened, I was like, oh, wait a minute. Is, do they have some kind of loophole we don't know about that they're going to come and try to shut us down? You know, like I need to have my facts together before I go. My family yeah. online, because I definitely was getting ready to go, you know, start figuring out when well, I figured out, but gathering the information on homeschooling. We had um, someone who spoke, uh, where was it? Oh, gosh, we just did something community and the lady. She spoke heavily on, oh, I know where I was at. I was at the Small Business Week with the City of Columbia. Uh, and there's a lady, and she she um, created a literacy game. They spoke heavily to the homeschooling, and the judges commented on the fact that she specifically uh, marketing homeschoolers and he was like, you know, that's something that people are not into but I'm glad you said that because people really need to start getting into homeschooling. I thought that was interesting that he said that at a government event but <laughs> Wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that we I think we do. If, if you can you know, try. I mean, I you know, it, it breaks my heart you know, when I drop my little, my little guy off at school in the morning and um you know, knowing what they're doing, knowing what they're teaching. And so I promised him that in the fall of 2017 that he will not be returning to public, uh, to the public school system. So if I have to utilize three and four hours out of my time 
you know, every day to educate him myself, I will, you know, I feel like we give our children, I feel like we have children and it's kind of like, we don't know what to do with them. So we give them over to a system and this system is, you know, molding their minds. This system is, you know, they work for this system. They're educated by this system. They're oppressed by this system. I agree. And um, I just want to do everything in my power, you know, to, 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 um, to take control you know, of, of my children, of, of their destiny, of the molding and shaping of their minds. And so, um, you know, my other ones, I mean, they're grown now, but they, they couldn't, um, I didn't homeschool them at all. They are products of um, uh, the Baltimore public school system, um, minus Isaiah, who's now in a private school. But um, my youngest, I, I vow to him that I, I won't send him through, that I, I'll just, I, I'll have to as a parent, you know, that's a part of your job. I don't, I don't want anybody else molding and shaping my child's mind. I want to be the primary molder and shaper of his mind. And that's not going on each day that I spend. Now I'm taking him to school. He's there for six or seven hours. He comes home. We go over homework. He eats. We may, you know, study together for maybe an hour. He watches TV and then we're asleep. So who's really molding his mind? It's not, it's not me. It is, it's really the school system. It's the teacher, it's Miss Uggs and Miss So-and-so and Mr. So-and-so. And so as parents, we got to get more involved in the conditioning process of our children. Um, but let's move on to the, uh, the main topic of today. The question is, why are so many black people single? And we're not making this up. We're not fabricating this. This is an actual fact that, you know, you have 16.9. And a matter of fact, let me share my screen. So we can show, so we can stick with the facts. Let me show this chart. Can everyone see this chart that I'm showing? Yes, I can. Okay, so this is a pie chart that I created uh, using the statistics from the Census Bureau report uh, in 2015. Now, if you look right here, and I don't know if you guys can see me moving my mouse around, right here in the light blue, this light blue represents the portion of, 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 of people that, I'm sorry, the portion of, of married couples. So you have 27%, okay, after you have a 16 point, let me break this down. You have 16.4 million African-American households in the U.S., 16.4 million. According to the Census Bureau report, only 27% of these households are headed by married couples. Only 27%. So you're saying, well, Dr. Maya, what about the other 73%? Well, 20% of that uh, consists of females with children and no spouse. And then you have 19.8% of these households are headed by single females with no children. 14.9% of these households are headed by single males with no children. And then you have 10.3% are headed by other, other relatives. So this might be granddad, grandma, you know, auntie, uncle. And then you have 6% cohabitate, cohabiting or cohabitating. Uh, and then 2% it says males with children and no spouse. All right. So this is the breakdown of the African-American households in the U.S. So 73% of our households are headed by really single people. And some of these single people have children. Some of these single people don't. And that's a fact. And this is what we see now. So the question is, what happened? Because according to the Census Bureau in 2012, they said that between 1890 in 1960, married couples hit 80% of all black households, which was a higher percentage than that of white counterparts. So between 1890 and 1960, so we're looking at emancipation. These are the periods of emancipation, uh, reconstruction, the Great Migration, um, the, uh, the Great Depression, World War I, World War II, Jim Crow, the black liberation movements of the 60s and 70s. So through it all, 80% of black households were governed by married people. 
But then when you look at today's statistics in 2015, we see that only 27, that percentage has dropped almost what, 53%? So now we're down, we went from 80% down to 20%. So I want to open the panel up to the sisters and ask what happened. Why do you think that there are so many black or so many single black households, so many single black people? What, what do you think? I would say, I would, I would say one of the reasons, of course, could definitely be uh, mass incarceration, that crack academic, you know, breakup into um, loss of generational information passed on of how important family is, unable to see uh, mom and dad in the household. Because um, I think coming along the way from the 90s, 80s, 90s, into the 2000s, you know, it's almost like singleness just became a fad. Um, it wasn't really a, a must that you actually get married. Um, the push, the push was was just do good, get a good job, get a good education, get a good job, think about family and kids later. I think so. I think it kind of just got it. It just kind of got out of hand. <laughs> um, but in reference to that piece, just from my own perspective, and then I wouldn't blame. I know a lot of people lately has been blaming it on feminism. I wouldn't blame it on that because if we did a survey and you know what, I think I'm going to do that. If we did, if we did a survey to what I call regular people, people who ain't even tuning into TV, us as social media, but they just tune into everything else that's going on in the world. They just having fun. They just want to make money and have fun. They don't want no kind of responsibility when it comes to children. And some, for that matter, uh, may want more than one, I call them sex partners, but more than one significant other. Or maybe just want to be single. They don't want to do, and it's lasting for a longer time, just in your teenage years and then some of your 20s. It's, it's going all the way up now, you know, 30s, 40s, whatever. And, and you hear people say things like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready mm. to have a family. I'm not ready to have ready. And so at the point becomes, well, when are you ready? And is family important or is having a family uh, legacy important to you? Time snuck up on me. <laughs> I didn't intend it to. But when I think in terms of having a spouse, I have some great examples. And if it does not match, you know, if I come along um, with individuals and they don't match. Like, perfect example right now, my um, my uncle lives with me, Uncle Charles, Cheryl Sher met him. And people like, most of the time, people mistake him to be my husband. And I have to say, no, that's my uncle because he does so much for me. But he, he does it because everybody knows I have a knee injury. So, um, and I have a multi level house. So, going up and down and just doing certain things just became a hindrance. So, he's there to help me. And then when I see how he maneuvered, and I've seen how he maneuvered when he was married. Um, and there's ended the divorce because of cheating and all that other extra stuff. But when I see how he maneuvers and how some of the other males in my family maneuver and how they, what they do, they don't, they don't, he doesn't have to be told to do something. Like he just does what a man do, <laughs> whatever a man does, he just do it. And I just, sometimes I just sit back and I watch and I'm, and, um, so the other day when I knew we was having this topic, I told him, I say, man, Uncle Charles, you to spoil me. I hate him. Uh, whoever I cannot draw the ball on oh, family matters and so I step my game up in, in the way I should from a female perspective so most people you know I look back and I'm like damn if this is the standard of a man when I tell y'all from cooking cleaning handling male responsibilities and he's my uncle so he's doing all of that stuff and, and, I, and I and so I pay him and he'd be like Mo you don't have to pay me I'm here to help you and I'm like, is this how you treated your wife? Like, when you were married, is this what you did? Because um, I used to sit back and watch him. I used to think they had the perfect little family. And he was like, well, this is what I've been raised to do. I just know what I need to do. I don't need nobody to tell me. I just handle my business as a man. So when you got standards like that, Dr. Maya, I mean, 
I'm like, you know, most people, when they, even for the fact of how a guy greets me, I don't be treated like this every day. So I'm like, you're going to have to, you need some male training. <laughs> you know, I don't even have to go on financial issues. I don't even have to go on any of that, that. My standard for a husband, the bar is up there. And it's not because I created it. It's because of what I see. My cousins who are married to their husbands, those guys are on it. What I call a man, man. The ones of us are underneath them who are single. We just haven't been treated like that. And so guys get upset. And when I say you're not, you're, you're, you know, you really not treat me like a woman should be treated. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to point fingers at you, but what I'm saying is, do you really honestly know how to be in a relationship? And if you don't, I, I just stay in my singleness. You know, I can't speak for other women, but I know why I do it. And it's because they drop the ball. They drop the ball a lot. And it's simple stuff. I'm not even talking about money. I'm not even talking. I'm just talking about just genuine companionship. Like, how do you operate? Genuine male, female, ship, love, just, oh, just, it's so soothing. I've experienced it. I want it again. And if it ever, if, if, if it will come, it's there. And I'll, I'll just bathe in it in a lifetime. But for the most part, man, I have a standard of men around me that I, even from the past I do part-time with to the other males and owners who will operate in, man, they got a standard out of this world. And they'll tell me, you, we need to check. Yeah, I'm good. Whoever, whoever you bring around more, we gonna have to check them. So, you know, <laughs> you know, and so I get, you know, cause I, I get scared sometimes. I'm like, man, if I bring, if I bring a guy in these, I know their standard. Like they are on it, Doctor. I mean, Doctor. My sister Lima, sister Cheryl. When I tell you, it's just automatic. They just do they get angry? Yes. Do they? You know, they yeah. communicate out great things. But when I tell you the those guys have really showed me a standard of a man that I can't settle and I won't not, not just for being loneliness. I'm, I'm not going to do it. And, and I'm going to be honest, just to piggyback off of what you said, I heard you say a lot of things, sister Monica, when you were talking about like why you think it, you know, people are just single. You said that some people blame feminism. Um, you said that it's, it's, ha it has now been popularized to be single, like it's become popular to kind of be single and free and to do your thing. I also, I also heard you say um, that people don't want the responsibility. Then I heard you also touch on uh, your personal experience and you were saying that you haven't, you know, met anyone to meet, you know, anyone, a guy that met your standards. So now, I, you know, I hear you say that it may be because of standards. It may be because people don't want the responsibility. It may be because of feminism. It may be because of, you know, how it's become popular to be, you know, single. Um, I actually agree with all of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I have, I, I did a presentation on that. And um, a lot of what you said is in my presentation. You know, um, I think that the feminist movement definitely damaged um, the community because you had black women who were standing alongside of white women and, saying, yeah, we want to, you know, it, the same thing. I mean, so I, I think that the feminine mo feminist movement was part of it. I do believe that now it has become popular to be single. Like you see it in commercials, you know, um, single mothers, you know, in commercials, single dads in commercials. Sometimes when you're shopping at the grocery store, even the advertisements are, you know, showing single moms or single dads. Um, the music glamorizes the single life. You know, men are talking about, I got a woman for every day of the week. You know, you got some women saying, I got men for every day of the week. So even the music, you know, promotes singularity. Um, it promotes singularity. And then you have the breakdown of the family structure. So like you said, that you had models, you, you had models, relationship models in your family, but then you have a lot of families, broken families, where children don't see a relationship model. So they don't even, you know, and I'm going to use myself for an example. I grew up with a single mom. My mom and father separated when I was one years old. I had a brother uh, who had me by 11 years. Um, he ended up passing in 1993. So it was really, it's really just been me and my mom. And 
I never saw the importance of being married because I never saw my mother married. So I never, you know, I didn't grow up and, you know, that wasn't an aspiration of mine to say, oh my gosh, one day I got to get a husband. I want to do this. I want to do that. Because the model in my home was a single mother that was doing the damn thing by herself. You know, she was going to school. She graduated from John Hopkins with her master's degree. She started, uh, she started working for Baltimore City as a reading specialist. She went from a reading specialist to an assistant principal, from an assistant principal to a principal, and then to the assistant to the area, uh, area executive in Baltimore City. So what I saw was a woman that was progressive. She doing a thing, you know. Um, you know, I just didn't. I, and so my aspiration wasn't to be a wife because I didn't witness the role of a wife in my home. And so I know that that's the story of a lot of our people. We don't see relationship models in the home. So you don't even aspire to be in one because you don't see it. You know, and it wasn't until I was older that I understood the sanctity of marriage and I understood the things you could do when you have a partner and you have companionship. It wasn't until I got older that I appreciated um, these things. Sister Alima, Sister Cheryl, what are, what are your thoughts on why so many black men and women are single? Well, I mean, I kind of jumped in the marriage game pretty early. I got married at 22. Yep, at 22. I got married, but in that age, I really didn't understand how to be a wife. He didn't necessarily understand the depth of how, you know, how to be a husband either, you know, but we managed through it. We had a daughter and the little bit of knowledge I did get, I gained from my grandmother. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up with my grandmother. I, well, I can't say grew up. I kind of went between three different, um, between my mom, my dad and my grandmother. So I kind of switched up, but I got that real grounding from my grandmother. Um, when I was in Alabama, and I knew a little bit about how I was supposed to treat a husband, but I still had that fire, that independent, you know, I'm, I, you know, I want to do this by myself. I want to, you know, and that was, that was just that streak I was in at, in my early 20s. But my husband did know how to treat a woman. You know, he opened the doors. He did all the manly things, but we still, like you were saying, I had not witnessed a working marriage, you know, in my family or anywhere else, you know? So it was kind of difficult for us to mesh and we did end up getting a divorce. And it's so funny because I tell this story to uh, people sometime and I think about it. Um, we divorced, we, we still had all okay terms, but I was like, that's okay, I can replace him. Y'all wanna know how long it took me to replace this ex-husband? until 2017 and I <laughs> I got a divorce wow. back in like tw 2000 so it took me freaking 17 years to find a guy that I felt like okay this is marriage material even though it ended up being a guy that I had in my past when I was in college before I met my um my husband um when I got married in 20 at 22 but I went through a lot in that 17 years and in that 17 years i learned this is how i'm supposed to treat my husband this is how i'm supposed to be treated you know so now you go into it with a different understanding of what a union means and building together instead of building apart and then coming together because a lot of people always want to do that. Let me get myself together, build myself up, get this degree, get that degree, get this job, do this. You know, then I'm going to pull this other person in. But not realizing that your bond is stronger when you're going through that fire together and you're building each other up and learning as you go. You know, it's a little bit more cohesive, I can say. So I learned a lot in these 17 years, but it definitely took me to 2017 <laughs> to find me a fiance um, that I really love. We're really gonna, you know, go forward. We know each other because this is some someone I had in my past. But um, just all the men in between, it, it, it's been a very difficult journey and I didn't desire to be 
single, but you just could not find that man that understood how to be a man and can actually put you in line with how to be a woman. Because you know, their favorite words are, um, the man is the head of the household. Well, but if he ain't heading something, <laughs> how are you going to follow a man that doesn't even know where he's going? You know, and then we had to dumb ourselves down in them 17 years because you want to make your man feel like he is a man. But am I really doing him uh, 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 myself a dis disservice is what I was doing because I'm dumbing myself down to appease this man that was probably never going to be my husband my husband so, anyway <laughs> so, so sister cheryl i heard you say a few things uh you know just now the last thing you ended with was you know being equally yoked you know how it's yep. kind of challenging you know to find someone that you're equally yoked like you said we've been trained to say okay i need to come with this this that and the third and you know and then you you go out and you're searching for a mate and then you have these expectations, you know, of this mate. You're saying, I, you know, I have my degree. I want a husband who has a degree, you know, or I have, you know, a job that brings in X amount of money. So I want a, um, you know, a husband that, or a husband or wife that brings in X amount of money. So then, you know, that kind of makes me think or feel that do we have some unrealistic expectations, you know, um, of our Sometimes mates? Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. Yeah. Like unrealistic I, expectations. And also, uh, you mentioned, you know, not knowing how to treat a man. Uh, a lot of women don't. <laughs> you know, I oh, didn't yeah. know. It, it was like a, it was a trial by error for me. You know, it was, it was trial by error, you know, when, um, when I got involved in different relationships. Because again, I never saw a consistent uh, relationship model in my home where I observed like my mom treating a guy a certain type of way. So when I grew up, again, it was just trial by error. I just treated him the way I saw fit, you know, and it, and, at, and at times it wasn't right. You know, it wasn't yeah. right. And, um, and so a lot of, of and that's, we're, 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 you know, this is a female show. So we're speaking from the female perspective, you know, a lot of us, we don't know how to treat a man, even if we did have a man that gave us X, you know, A, B, and C, or came with all of these things that we want him to come with. Some women don't know what to do with him. And I don't we know don't. about you guys, but I know over the years, I have learned to tame what we call the mouth. <laughs> because a lot of men be like, your mouth though, exactly. your mouth, <laughs> your words. And I'm like, what are you saying? <laughs> you know, us black women, you know, our tongues are, our tongues are lethal, and we will chew a man down. You yes, know, we, we will chop a man to smithereens and then think mad why he said he don't want to love you no more. But girl, you know, yep. Because I think women bounce back a little bit more than men. Because when we, I'm not I, saying that men don't I, love hard. I, but we love for real hard. Exactly. So if you come at us and you do something, it's more than likely we'll take you back after cheating or doing something. But when that happens to a man, it cuts his very soul. It's like it's over. It's, it's hard to get that back sometimes. Mm -hmm. So we bounce back. But when we strike them with our tongue, yeah, you almost, depending on what you say, you could go on and just call that a, a end of a relationship <laughs> and, and, and find another one. Because I've done that in several relationships. I say something, and he was like, oh, 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 okay. And you know that meant, oh, okay, I don't think I'm going to recover from this. <laughs> That's so true. That's you know, so true. But speaking on the um, single, yeah. everybody was talking about what they saw when they were growing up, and it made me sit and think, like, what did I see growing up? And from what I saw, most of the women in my family and the men, too, they, they were married. And they uh, pretty much weren't single until their spouses passed away. Mm. So, so that's, for the most part, now that I'm reflecting, that's what I saw. So, you know, upon that, once they're single and they've been married for so long and their spouse is deceased, you know, that's, if they choose to stay single, then I understand that. You've been married for 30 years. Maybe you can't move on. But other than that, I agree with a lot of the things that the sisters said. I definitely would say that the feminist movement 
did play a part in it because women wanted to be independent and broke up a lot of families. Um, I would also have to say uh, the drug era, like Sister Monique was saying, uh, the crack, cocaine, and all of that, that definitely ruined a lot of families. And like you guys were saying, though, the basis is, is what did you see when you were coming up? You didn't see a lot of strong families, I mean, strong marriages and, and successful marriages, then quite yeah. naturally, that's not something that, that you would yearn for unless you just are a lover, you know what I mean, at heart. Yeah. And so I think that being that I saw so much love that I did see, even through the dysfunction, I still, they were still married. You know, they mm -hmm. still stuck it through. They still hung in there. So that always said to me that marriage is a good thing. It might be hard and you're going to have some tough times, but it's a good thing and it's worth it. Yes. You got and, and I'm glad. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh no, I was, just going, I was just going to say, Sister Monica, real quick. Um, Sister Lima is 100% uh, correct um, that, you know, marriage is a beautiful thing. But we have to keep in mind that you have challenges in a marriage. I think, right. I think that with Western culture, you know, growing up as little girls, I remember watching Beauty and the Beast. I remember watching Sleeping Beauty, Snow mm -hmm. White, um, Lady and the Tramp, you know, and it was always this, this heavily, you know, living happily ever after, um, happy, you know, this fantasy world. So you're like, you know, growing up, you know, Barbie had Kent. You want to find your Kent. You know what I mean? You want to find your Kent. You want to find your prince. And the real world is just not like that. And so a lot of people, as soon as, you know, as soon as challenges arise, uh, arise in, in, in the marriage or in the relationship, people are ready to get a divorce. You know, maybe we are having some financial difficulties at this point, or maybe, you know, we're not seeing eye to eye on certain things. But that doesn't mean abandon your marriage. Um, you know, back in the day when people got married, that was considered like a final thing. That was like it was cemented. It was it was final. It wasn't okay. I'm gonna get married, and if things don't work out, I had this option to just go get divorced. You know, marriage was a permanent thing, and I think that nowadays we don't treat it like it's a permanent thing. I think it's just like you know, look, you know, people change spouses like they change underwear. If it doesn't work out. You know, I'll just go get a divorce or I'll just, you know, step outside of my marriage or I'll just do this. You know, relationships take work and going into a relationship or entering into a relationship. We have to understand that that relationships take work. And I caution people before they join themselves with anybody. Do your due diligence on this person. Find yes. out their back, their upbringing. And this is what I told my sons yeah. recently. I told my sons. I said, if you want to know what type of woman you're dealing with, go meet her mother. Mm -hmm. That's who you need to yep. spend time with. Go meet her mother. Ooh. Sit down. When you go over there to watch a movie with her, kick it with her mom. See how her mom thinks, how her mom behaves. If she has a man in the house, see how the mom treats that man. Because ultimately, that's how the daughter is going to treat you. And let me share something personal with you. Uh, my son Harvey, when he was going to Milford, he was dating a young girl. And he came back to me. He was interested in this, you know, little high school girl or whatever. And he was telling me how um, he was getting ready to break up with her because um, he he didn't like the way she speaks to him. Like she would, you know, get loud with him in the cafeteria and all of that. And so then I asked him, I said, well, when you go over to her home and you're watching TV with her, because the girl, you know, had a stepdad in the house. I said, well, how did the mom treat the stepdad? And he said, the same way she treats me. The mom talks to the stepdad any kind of way. And I said, there you go. So she's in the household with a guy that's being talked to any type of way. So she's growing up and she's thinking that she could talk to her, her guy friends, her boyfriends, the same way she's witnessed her mom talking to her stepdad. So um, oh, I forgot where I was going. I was going all over the place just now. I, I just lost my train of thought. Just got <laughs> where was I going, Thanks, Sister Check the background. Yes. So thank you, Sister Monica. So I always implore brothers and sisters to check the background of the person you are dealing with. You know, meet the parents of this individual. Find out about their childhood. How did they grow up? You know, what were their experiences growing up? 
Are they a victim of molestation or uh, sexual violation? Have they ever been abused verbally or physically? You know, what kind of values and morals and principles, you know, do they stand on? You know, what, what are their ideas on family? What are their ideas on child rearing? These are the questions that we need to ask acts before we even adjoin ourselves with an individual and then we also need to determine if we're going to grow with this individual i always tell my sons that relationships whether platonic or intimate should be formed for the purposes of growth if you are not growing within this friendship or in this relationship then it is a distraction and what i mean by growth growth mentally spiritually emotionally uh, financially, are you growing with this person? And if the answer is no, get out. I just wanted to say that. You, man, you hit that on the head. Um, the two, the two that I want to highlight is the morals and the growth. Um, of course, I'm in the Bible Belt, so everybody over here want to keep me barefoot and pregnant for some reason. But that's not what I do. I like to get out. I like to help the community. If someone's is definitely, if they, if 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 the traits, if it's, I always have these three things. If, if I can, if I can compromise, tolerate compromise, or there's zero tolerance at all, then I have to discuss it. Mm. I notice a lot of sometimes, sometimes guys look at discussion as nagging that's it's not a nag if if we have a concern we have to voice your concern so that you can squash it where it is and you can move on uh in the area where i'm at right now this hierarchy thing is i'm in charge i'm in charge i'm in charge if i sit back and you can't do everything you're gonna get upset and say i'm not doing it they, it's almost like as the guys aren't like they don't really know they don't really understand that whole helper mentality. Like, I'm here to help you. I'm really, really here to help you. And and so with everything, not just in one area, but we can do this together. And, and, and it's almost like guys and girls are like, I do things together on all levels. It's always got to be some type of hierarchy thing. Why can't we just do it together? You know? That's right. That's right. Push out. Oh, it's, it's like, oh, well, this person got to be the you know, and I'm like, oh, you're driving me crazy. Um, and then in reference to the, um, the you know, growing, it's like, if you get a, you know, when I was in college, I, and I see this guy to this day, and he always said, you know what, well, you was my first and only love, Monica. I don't know how I ever let you go. And I said, well, I can tell you, when we were in college, I was a year ahead of him. I graduated and I said, hey, listen, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to do this? You know, where do we need to live? I already know what, what your work um, desires was going to be or what your skill or your occupation was going to be. I was, I just was going to blend in with whatever career field that I can maneuver in because I always say I was going to get something where no matter where I went in the world, I would still be able to maintain. So I'm in the accounting field, of course. And um, I can recall, oh, my God, clear as day, he said, well, um, my orders to, I said, you know, I'm going to join the army because I don't want to just sit dormant and do nothing, you know, and then get idle. So I said, you know, I'm going to join the army. So I joined the army because I was stateside and uh, it was like, I got those orders to Germany and they say, lamb, you can take the orders or you can, you can, you know, you don't have to go because, because the unit was folded. So you can stay or you can go. And I said, I called my little, my boyfriend at the time who I thought I was going to marry. And they say, um, hey, listen, I got orders to Germany. You want to go with me to Germany? You know, you'll be graduating in a few months. You can come and meet me or whatever. That can't say, <laughs> I ain't lost nothing in Germany. <laughs> you know, really, what do you want me to do? When we stay, when we go, what do you want me to do? Well, just don't go with what you want to go. I said, you know what? I can't do this because y'all don't know where y'all want to go. You ain't got no way for me to be. You just want me to just flap in the wings and say you think that you're ready to do something. And even to this day, I think with with growing, you know, as they say, women think, you know, women get mature a little quicker than the guys or whatnot. So along the way, I, I what I would do is um, I that's how I ended up with so much education or whatnot. And I, that was like my buy time moments for the guys. No matter, I completed the degree, then I'll be like, okay. 
Is it time yet? No. Okay, let me go get back in another degree program. Let me go occupy my mind with something else. So it's almost like, and I'm talking about women who are, you know, who doing the darn thing. Not, not, not women who sitting there ain't got nothing going on for nothing. You know, just living balance and trying to do great things so they could be compatible with the, with the husband someday. And it's almost like, man, y'all chilling too darn long. Like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> Sometimes I just think the guys chill just a bit too long, but then I also think they take advantage of that racial differences. I really think they do. We got so many women, so little of them, and I just think they just be having a field day, Dr. Maya, Sister Cheryl, Sister Lima. I really do. I don't think they in the rush for anything that has to do with family. I just think that they just kind of be chilling along the way and be like, oh, you know, I got my man girl over here, and I'll go play over there. And oh, don't wait a minute. Let me love on her while I go play. But I think women oh, play a big part in that, Sister Monica. Talk about it. Talk about it, Sister Monica. Men mm-hmm. no longer view and respect women the way they used to. Number one, everybody's so damn dependent. Everybody's doing them. They got their own money. So it seems like that's all they're concerned with. And then number two, everybody's so overly sexual now. And so I don't know where that stemmed from, but. It's nothing to just see a naked woman or a half-dressed woman. So it's like, what, what is my incentive? Where are the good girls? What is my incentive for settling mm. down? What is my incentive for just sleeping with one woman? I say all the time, women are the one that control shit. If women are the Come ones on. who actually, Come on, actually, sis. actually handle themselves accordingly and set the rules and say, this is how I'm going to handle myself and be respectable, a man will follow suit because they're going to do what they're going to do to get women. So we as yep. women really need to take responsibility for how men are and how they Come have become. Because when I was coming up, men weren't like they are now. Of course, they were always, they're always going to be how they are, but they were different. And they, they, they treated women differently and they, they approached women differently. It just, it just wasn't like it is today. And chicks now are proud thoughts and side chicks. And it's like, what be- incentive Come to be on. in a relationship with a woman like that? None. Come on. Oh my God, she got me over here stomping my feet right now. <laughs> just like yeah. she is so correct. Like Sister Lima was so dead on that we as women have to take responsibility for how men are today. I'm sorry. We had to. Like she said, what is the incentive? Like, for example, I was in Security Mall a few years ago, uh, sisters, and uh, there were these guys, there were these young guys, they were walking in front of me. And then there were two girls walking in front of the young guys. And the young guys said, hey, hey, you, hey. And and both of the girls turned around and they said, well, who are you talking to? And he said, he said, shit. He said, and excuse my language. I'm just trying to like give you guys a, you know, try to paraphrase what what happened. Mm -hmm. So just excuse my language. So the guy said, he said, he said, shit. He said, I. I don't give a fuck which one of y'all come over here. I don't oh, want wow. to come over here. Wow. All right. I'm talking about I witnessed this with my own eyes. And you know what happened? Both of the guy dad went and went over there too. Of he course. said, he said, I don't give a fuck which one of y'all come over here. Of course. He said, he said, just one of y'all. I want one of y'all, one of y'all. And both of the girls went to him. I was in the car with my uncle, true story. After my grandmother died in 2005, I was in the car with both of my uncles. And uh, we were riding downtown. My uncle was drunk. You know, he's, you know, he's grieving his mom. He's feeling some type of way while we were downtown. He almost got into a fight with another guy. So he was just acting out that night. So anyway, I'm in a van with them. I'm sitting in the back. Both of my uncles are in the front. That Well, in the, in the front. So one is driving. One is a passenger riding shotgun. So we, we pulled up. There was, there was a car full of females um, on our right side at a, at a red light. So my uncle, who was, you know, intoxicated, he rolled down the window and, you know, he told the girl to roll down her window. She rolled down her window and he said, how you doing, baby? And she said, she said, I'm doing OK. He said, yeah, I want to. He said, I want to get your number. He said, I, you know, I'm trying to get that, that that pussy. I'm just, you know, not being trying to be derogatory. I'm just letting you guys know what we said. He's like, you know, I'm trying to get that pussy. And the girl was like, OK, she said, wait a minute. Let me let me give you my number. This is what he said to her. <laughs> and she, and she gave him the number. Huh? She gave him the telephone number. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. You know, so 
I so agree with Sister Alima that we set the standards. People treat you the way you allow them to treat you. And, you know, we allow men to say and do certain things. So it's become a damn culture. You know, like men are having, I mean, oh my gosh, you know, I know guys that are carrying multiple relationships right now and no disrespect to, you know, anybody who practices um, polygamy to each his own. But, you know, we as women, we are allowing this behavior because we are not setting a standard, a universal standard, not just one or two women say, I'm not going to accept this. We don't have a universal standard, a universal sister code for how we want to be treated. What are our demands as women? We don't have them. You know, I we mean, don't respect not. ourselves. How are we going to have some type of demands and put a demand on a man and tell him how we feel we should be treated? Well, we don't even know how to treat ourselves. We don't even exactly. respect ourselves. Like we, we don't even have the right to even say I that. I agree. Because, you know, you said that we allow men, but I would say we groomed men mm. to be the way that they are. Mm. We have groomed them to be this way. I don't mm. care if they don't, women listening don't agree, but we have done this. Yes, we have. We really have. And it's time for accountability. This way. And it's time for accountability, Sister Alima. Like what I've noticed is a lot of women don't want to take accountability for, for what we're doing. You know, it's just no accountability. So like you said, you got women who may disagree with what you just said or what I said. But these are the women who don't want to own what we have done. And since me and my husband were just having this conversation, which is in tune to this, and we were talking about how, you know, women feel that if a man is real polite or really into them and, you know, call them. Like he gave example, like, he's like, do you think, how would you feel when you were single? Like if a man gave you, uh, you gave a man his num your number and he called you like automatically, like you want him to call you automatically or should he wait a few days? Cause he was like, certain women think that's lame. And I'm like, that's true. I've heard that women think that it's corny. Like he called me already girl, or he opening all the doors for me, girl. And he calling uh -huh. me queen and he calling me guys. And I'm just like, he just doing the most, but let a dude call you a bitch. Come on. Then you with it though. Like now you feeling it. Now this is the man that you want to be with. So it's like the good guy, the good guy is dying down. It's dying out because women are killing him. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That's that's true. Um, and a lot of these men now are in a strip club and making these women wives. They really are. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Lala. And her husband right now, you out with a stripper and you'd have got this girl pregnant. Like, come on now. You know, <laughs> I, I don't understand that whole mentality, but it's a lot of men out here that's trolling the strip clubs looking for their wife. You know, not just a fun time. They don't want the woman um, that is going to expect something or have certain things that criteria. You know, you got to respect me. You have to act a certain manner. They don't want that woman. They want the one that could do whatever and she'll, you know, she'll be okay with it. Let's work for me. I still got somebody I can do on the side and I got the main chick. So mm -hmm. that's that's how society is going now. And, also, and it's very media, sad. Sister, what y'all think? Does yeah. the media have a big part in it? And what's going Absolutely. on? Because Sister Maya put up the living single picture, right? So think about living single and think about how those women were and how they handled men. But look at the era that we in today. Yeah. This real housewives. That's a fact. Now. This is real housewives loving hip hop era. It's no longer the living single era. It was totally Hello? different. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 yeah, I think that I think that some of the 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 good behaviors are those who are um trying to combat and, and mentor girls or women groups for that matter it gets overshadowed with those type of traits. And so then we got to battle someone. It's almost like you got to go through this whole protocol thing to prove that you, you're not that girl. You won't accept it. And then you got to buffer. What I've, what I've noticed amongst women you know, falling in those categories or you know what? You, you Be who you are. And if that's who you, if that's who you are, know that you are ruining, you're ruining the reputation of other women who know to do better or who, who don't attract that type of drama. Exactly. When I was in Kosovo, I had a, I had a um, first sergeant. Um, and at that time, I think I was about 23, 24. 
So, you know, I thought I was my, you know, I was a little hot stuff or whatever. So I'm down there and I'm, it's about the ratio, about 15 women, about a thousand men soldiers over there. But anyways, we would be your clothes on the weekends. And um, of course, every soldier or every military person long for the day that you can put your own clothes on, especially if you're in the combat zone. And and um, I wore this little outfit, and it wasn't provocative, provocative but it, it was form fitting. And um, and you know, I got all kind of unwanted attention. And my first sergeant pulled me to the side, and he said, "Sergeant Lamb, I noticed you frown when certain guys holler at you a certain way. Give you a tip of advice. Um, what you wear is going to attract." the type of men that you're not mm-hmm. attra- that you don't really want. And I was like, what do you mean? You know, because I thought my little outfit was cute. And, uh, he was like, okay, let's think about it. So, you know, we went through this whole little wardrobe scenario. So then from that point on, I was very mindful of who I wanted, what I was wearing when I wore it. And so it changed my wardrobe perspective because at the time I would wear form pretty clothes because I thought I had a nice shape and I would, I I wasn't trying to portray myself in a negative way, but I just thought I was looking cute. But then I was actually getting negative attention because what I was wearing was not appropriate to what I wanted, right? So I think, um, but I, I still think in, a, in the same sense, a lot of the negative vibe, the negative shows out there, things that get attention that we don't want to represent us as a woman gets that attention and it gets it in mass volumes. Walk in those shadows. I, um, I, I'm not sure at what point it would get to where we can have the shows or the images or the videos or the music that represents the appropriateness necessary for a woman to uh, to get the type of attention or to be treated the way she needs to be treated. But I, I just think that on the, I, I'm a firm believer of on the spot correction. So I know about I mean, my school. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead, go ahead, finish your thoughts, sis, because I was getting ready to piggyback on something you just said. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, I know um, the the ladies in my circle, in reference to appropriateness and what we attract, we, we try to be accountable for one another. And I appreciate those ladies, especially those who are older than me, because I have a habit of hanging around older ladies. And they will on the spot correct us quickly if we look or act or speak inappropriate in a certain way that's going to draw a certain type of attention. And so those on, on the spot of corrections along the way and over the years help shape the woman that I am. And so I don't, I don't get that so much these days because of course I've, I've been cultivated and mentored through the way. So I think on the spot of corrections with young women or women, even in that matter, even if they cuss you out, you know, let them know, Hey, listen, we don't, you might want to fix that. But then some people are too ratchet too. So we might got to get strapped on some of them. <laughs> yeah, but like like you said, we got to be mothers to other women. Yeah. Um, You know, we got to start, you know, when you see little girls doing certain things. And even outside where I live at, um, you know, um, I had witnessed, um, you know, a little boy. He was out there, you know, feeling on a girl at a playground. And um, at the time, my son and his friends were playing on the playground. These were two teenagers, you know, and he was out there groping her and kissing on her and doing all sorts of inappropriate things, you know, in public and in front of children. So of course, um, you know, once I saw that I had to go outside and, and, and say something, um, but you know, I pulled them up, I pulled them aside. And of course, you know, the little boy act like he didn't want to hear what I had to say, but I was telling them, Hey, you know, you know, you're disrespecting this. I told the girl, you are allowing him to disrespect you. He's groping you. If I could see it outside of my window, Lord knows how many other people, or outside looking, sitting on a step, or outside the window. He's disrespecting you. He's groping you. He's touching you. He's feeling on you. I mean, he doesn't even respect you enough to take you into a corner. You know what I mean? So I actually had a conversation with them about that. And then the mere fact that you have other children on the playground, like this is very inappropriate, you know? And um, so anyway, I say all that to say I agree with you in that we have to start mothering our other, we have to mother the children in the community. We need the damn village back. That's, I mean, that's what it boils down to, Sister Monica, Sister Aleem, and Sister Cheryl. We need the village back. We need eyes on our children at all times. Miss so-and-so, Mr. So-and-so. To pull your child no up. If you see your child, no conversations. Okay. We need the village yeah, back. The con- you know? Do you realize, now, Dr. Mayad, I didn't mean to cut you off, but you, you, since you're talking about the village piece, 
the conversations that they're having in front of young people, I'm like, are y'all really talking about this in front of children? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, go back to the village concept. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, we need to start mothering and fathering. I think I put up on a, a post on Facebook. I was saying how mothering and fathering is not exclusive to, you know, children in your household, you know, biological children or people who actually had children. You know, when you step outside of your door as a woman, you are a mother. So whoever, whatever child you come in contact with that looks like you, a part of our ethnic group, you are Nana, you are mother. Whether you bore children or not bore children, you are an example of a mother. And you should be mothering these children when you come in contact. And likewise for the men, likewise for the men, when you step outside your door, you are a father to all that you come in contact with. So the bottom line is, we need to reestablish the village. We need to reestablish the family structure. A lot of our babies are going into gangs and all of that because they want to feel like they are a part of something. And a lot of these people are coming, a lot of those children, when I've interviewed them in Baltimore, they've come from broken homes, broken families, and they want to feel loved. They want to feel protected. They want to kick it, you know, and so they go to the streets with the gang members who are creating a sort of family structure um, for the for our babies. So we got to reestablish the family structure and then reestablish the, the reestablish the village. You know, because when you think of the village, the village was just a collection of clans, a collection of families. Well, wait a minute. In order to reestablish the village, you got to reestablish the family. But in order to reestablish the family, we have to repair male female relationships. We have to, because right now we see that 73% of us are single. We're living single. So in order to build, people are talking about unify or die and we want a nation build. How the hell are you going to nation build when the fundamental elements of nation building don't get along? And the fundamental elements are the males and the females. So as long as you have males and females at odds, you will never build a nation because that is key to building a nation, a solid relationship between a male and a female. That's the key. So we got to understand. And I agree with you, Sister Monica, going back to a thought that you expressed, you were saying, why is it in this community that there's this hierarchy? I, I blame that on religion. I blame that on Western culture. I blame that on them because in African culture, there wasn't a hierarchy. Um, by Ife, Ife Amadoume, um, male daughters, female husbands. And I know the title might sound a little crazy, but male, female, male daughters, female husbands. Read that book because in that book, she talks about the culture of the Igbo people. And she was saying how men and males and females, there weren't like gender specific roles. Like in the household, she was saying that men and women filled roles that were conducive to the growth and development of their families. So it wasn't a hierarchy thing, you know? So if you were a man and you stayed at home and you, you took care of the children or you, you know, you had more of the domestic duties of the household, um, you didn't, you know, it wasn't frowned upon, you know, or if you were a woman and you were the breadwinner, you wasn't considered a feminist or a woman that wants to be independent. It was just, they took on roles that were conducive to the growth and development of their households. There was no hierarchy. There was complementarity. Read the book by uh, Baba Baruti, Complementarity. That's what the Africans practice. We understood harmonious duality, harmonious dualism, complementarity, right? Yes. Yes, high five, definitely. You know, yeah. but you know what's missing? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just coming. No, go ahead, sis, Alima. Go ahead, sis. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Go ahead, sis. I wasn't gonna, yeah, and I wasn't going to say anything. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I think um, how, when you, you mentioned Did religion, you? how it messed up a lot of things and created the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like spirituality oh, no. is what's missing in uh, a lot of relationships. Because, you know, aside from just your personal spiritual relationship, you need that in your relationship with your spouse as well. I really feel that for me personally, that's what helps to keep our marriage balanced is the spirituality. 
Because without it, you know, I just, you know how we are as people. You get mad. You're like, I'm done with this shit. But, you know, when you have spirituality, you know, you can you can go to your reaches and, and you can go and you can get readings and you can do things to help better your relationship. And also when you have a strong example of a marriage, even if it's not someone that's in your family, like Baba Baruti, for instance, I talk to him and ask him questions and things because he's a, he, he's a perfect example of a strong, powerful marriage. And I think if we want strong, healthy relationships, then that's the start. Get our spirits right. That's right. Get our spirits right and reach out to some elders who can help us. Because a lot of times we try to figure things out by ourselves, but African culture is community-based. That's right. That's right. the same thing with relationships. That's right. I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more that um, that the family, you know, it, <laughs> that relationships, the family, these were communal entities. And I, I feel like Western culture has uh, taught us to view relationships as a personal thing. You hear people say, you know, this is my relationship. Mm-hmm. This is my relationship. Well, no, 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 no. Because whoever you are joining yourself to, and I made this clear with my sons, whoever you are joining yourself to, it affects our entire family. <laughs> Not just you. It affects everybody. You impregnate this girl and we don't all get along or don't share the same values. It's confusion that you're bringing to the clan. And matter of fact, I met a... um. I met a sister a few weeks ago um, because I'm teaching a class over at the Baltimore Urban um, Baltimore Urban League. is a class um, you know, called, entitled uh, Introduction to uh, Entrepreneurship. And, um, you know, it, the sister that's running it, you know, she was just like, I believe in arranged marriages. And I said, so do I. I totally agree. I totally agree with arranged marriages. I totally agree with the elders in the family vetting who you're with before you solidify your relationship with this individual. I totally agree with it. Um, you know, because relationships, again, like you said, Sister Alima, it's a communal thing. It's not an individual thing. It's not a personal thing because you're bringing this person into my household, our household, you know? And so these decisions will affect us. These decisions will affect us also. And so we gotta, we gotta, you know, we really have to um, rid ourselves of this individualistic mentality. I'm telling you, Dr. Amos Wilson and almost all of his lectures, and you can watch a lot of them online. And a matter of fact, uh, Donnie Mossberg has a channel and he has dozens of um, uh, Dr. Amos Wilson lectures. And a matter of fact, when I hang up with you guys, I'm gonna watch um, the lecture that Dr. Amos Wilson gave on uh, special education and black children. But anyway, Dr. Amos Wilson speaks a lot about you know, the fact that we've been inculcated with the ideology of individualism and it spills over to different aspects of our life, to our relationships. That's a personal thing. Your marriage is now a personal thing. Your children are your children, not our children, but they're your children. Um, Even down to economics. I know a brother in the chat room mentioned economics. Even with economics, it seems like it's a rat race. You know, instead of us working together collectively to establish businesses and to build them and maintain them, you know, you have people who are like, I'm going to do my own thing rather than, OK, yes, you can do your own thing. But let's hook up with brothers and sisters in a community that are doing similar things and let's build. You know what I mean? So we really have been inculcated with the spirit or with the ideology of individualism. So bottom line is we have to be re-Africanized. And that's what uh, Brother Kwame Okoto talks about in his book, Nation Building. We have to become African again until we become African again, we will not build a nation. We will continue to have the highest divorce rates. We will continue to see all sorts of deviant behaviors in our community until we reestablish our culture. And that's the bottom line. Yeah. You know, I never, you know, I never really paid attention to how uh, different people and how people relate to family until I, you know, until I start hearing people say that, because I just thought, you know, I always thought that, that, you know, that family wouldn't always be a problem or the person being compatible with your family until I start paying attention to it. And I remember thinking about, it goes, let me, let me try this out. And I, um, I normally don't bring guys home. Oh Lord, no, not that you're not 
gonna make a because my I got some traditional folk. My aunt them, they're like, if you ain't about to marry him, well, we don't need to meet him. <laughs> he better have some because they're gonna bet you down to the end. Like, uh, and you better not say, oh, you know, oh, I'm just we we just trying it out or we just gonna be, you know, we just dating for right now. Oh my God, they, you, you would wish you never met them because they're gonna be like, well, why are you here? Well, what you talking to a fuck? Well, she don't need that, you know. All the extras. But anyways, I start paying attention to certain traits. And uh, one in particular, um, I'm from Louisiana, so we are festival-oriented. I mean, in all types of Creole culture, um, island type, uh, you know, we just festival, everything. We celebrate everything. And family gathering is, is really, it's unheard of if you don't show up type of deal. And, and um, I met a young fellow, and he was not interested at all and I was like uh I, right now because if you're not going to come visit family if you're not going to come and be a part of the festivals the things that we do we is not going to make it because I know within me every even though I don't get involved with the holidays and, and I just do something totally different because family still do it so you, you're still going to be amongst it I it's something in me when I'm away from home when those times of the year come around, I got to be home. Like, I got to go. Or I have to be amongst some type of family gathering. If I don't create one on my own, I have to be amongst that. Like, I start going through withdrawals. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't be this. I can't do this, you know. I have to be amongst everybody else and amongst the culture and amongst the people. And I remember this person was just an individual. And I was like, man, oh, this ain't going to work. And I and I was like, man, I ain't even, I didn't think... This was an actual factor. Like, so much as you being an outgoing person or somebody who just like to be a homebody. And I was like, man, I need to pay attention just a little bit more. And I think, like, some stuff just kind of goes over our head. Because like you said earlier, Dr. Mayotte, we got to, you got to know who you're dealing with. And some, um, uh, sometimes we look for the, the abnormalities such as abuse and neglect. But just some things that just kind of makes you happy. And what are some things you just like to do for fun? And if and and if it's side, you know, if it's if it's um one sided, then somebody's gonna get neglected, and you just may not make it. And I just want to add um, because I'm looking at the comments chat room. Uh, we have uh, in the chat room uh, Minister Minister Asar from the Temple of New African Thought, and he was saying, you know, that we are in need of healing. He was saying with all of the trauma that has uh, taken place, you know, all of the atrocities were that were committed uh, to black folks, you know, that created, you know, PTSD, we call it post-traumatic slave syndrome. I mean, I mean, that's a fact. We're dealing with trauma. And uh, he's actually, he's gonna be talking about this on June. I don't know if you guys can see my screen. On Saturday, June the 10th, uh, at the Temple of New African Thought from 4 p.m. To 7 p.m., he's going to be talking about white oppression, black trauma, an Afrocentric approach to healing. We are really in need of healing. And, um, you know, I just wanted to, to plug that. I, you know, the brothers in the chat room, I want to thank him for uh, tuning into the show. But um, yes, we are in need of healing. And until we heal, I don't see us nation building until we deal with the trauma that has taken place, well, the effects of the trauma that have taken place. So I'll be there on the 10th, and I'm looking forward um, to his presentation, to his workshop, White Oppression, Black Trauma, an Afrocentric Approach to Healing um, by Minister Dennis Asaw Winkler. Visit, uh, let me see right here, this is the link, ConsciousBlackBusiness.com to check it out. All right, so I just definitely wanted to you know, plug that, uh, put that in. So. Yes. Yes. Oh. That, that definitely, I look at healing from more than just a negative kind con, con, uh, healing from that you may come across and you just, you know, when you react a certain way, you got to pay attention to your own reaction and the effects that it's causing around you so that you can actually go in and you know, talk that through or get some help. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. We got to heal, man. It is. Yeah. Some of the simplest and things then, that we don't. 
Yeah, and then sis, I was just sitting here thinking about there was a lecture. Dr. Patricia Newton came to town um, a few weeks back and she did a lecture. I, I forgot the title of it, but she was talking about, you know, uh, sexual politics. I believe that was the title. But during her lecture, she revealed to um, to us that in Baltimore, she said that eight out of 10, um, eight out of every 10 black women in Baltimore have been um, sexually violated. And then she said um, amongst the men, I think the statistics were six out of every 10 um, men in Baltimore have been sexually violated. So we're dealing with broken people, you know? So can you imagine, you know, sister, sisters, you know, getting in relationships with some of these women who have been sexually violated or men that have been sexually violated and, you know, not really knowing if they've dealt with that or how it affected them. We are definitely in need of healing. And until we, until we heal, I don't see us having successful relationships. I'm talking about intimate or platonic, you know, you know, it, it took me, um, years and I love my male friends. They've loved me through, um, all of the different stages of my life. Um, but you know, I was very angry with men, you know, growing up because, you know, I had a, a father that wasn't, you know, consistent and very irresponsible and negligent. And so that turned into my anger, you know, for men, I was angry. I, you know, girl, I would curse a man out in a heartbeat. I would say, lose my number. Don't call me anymore. Hang up on him. I mean, I totally mistreated guys. And it wasn't until, you know, I started, and it wasn't until I did a self-assessment and, uh, and realized why, like, where did this come from? Why do I have this negative perception of men? And so I did a complete self-assessment and found out, well, is it because you were sexually violated at the age of eight? Yeah, that's probably why. Is it because your dad wasn't, you know, around? Uh, that's probably why too. You know, is it because, you know, you're not used to, you know, a male present in the household, you don't know how to treat them, talk to them. So I had to do a self-assessment. And, and then I also had to heal from all of that. So um, I'm a much evolved person than I was, you know, one year ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, because I, you know, it's a process, you know, and I'm still healing and then trying to, you know, encourage other women um, to heal from the things that we've taken, the things that we've experienced. So, you know, I say all that to say that until we heal, there's no way that we're going to have healthy, you know, properly functioning relationships. And that will spill into different aspects of our life. Like one of the brothers said um, in a chat room, he was saying healthy relationships. I believe Dennis Asar said this. He said healthy relationships are a requisite, he said, for economics. You know, yeah. economics is about relationships. Yeah. You know, and if you don't know how to formulate healthy relationships. How can we conduct econ how can we conduct business with each other if we don't even know how to have a relationship with each other? And so um I want to close out, sisters. It's 246. We've been going strong for about an hour and 40 minutes. Do you have any last words uh for the for the viewers before I start shouting out everybody in the chat room? I would I would I would say this should lead into the next show next week on healing techniques for everything you just spoke with in the end, Dr. Maya, because I can definitely attest to um, when I made a comment, Dynasty, in reference to the, the darkism conversation that it was having. And I talked about our love in the skin, I'm in event and how we use some of the techniques to go out and help other sisters and young girls that are dealing with certain situations. I think that a lot of people, both male and female alike, all of those books that you actually just discussed at the tail end, that we put some of those up, if you could put them in like on a PowerPoint format so that people can actually see them and begin to go through their own self-assessment to start healing. Because some people have to do it privately. Some people need to go and see specialists. Right. Some people need a group session. And I think that is very important right now as a start for anybody. And I think that could be a topic of discussion for next week. What are some ways to heal to, to lead you into a healthy, really a, a healthy you into a healthy relationship with someone else? Let's do it. Let's do it. So next week um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll put together the topic, the title and, and start promoting it. So a conversation on healing. And like you said, what are, what are some healing techniques? And I would love if minister Asar if Minister Dennis Asar could come in and join us, because I know he's going to be doing a lecture on this um, on June the 10th. And I know he probably doesn't want to give it all to us. But if he could come and just join a panel and talk about, you know, healing from this from this trauma, 
that we have um, that we have um, experienced. So I, I love it. I think that's an awesome idea for a topic um, next week, Sister Monica. So I'm you know I'm all for it. Sister Alima, do you have any last words, sis? Sister Cheryl. No, I don't. I think we covered everything, and it was a great show, sisters, as always. Oh yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yep, I agree too. Great show. No doubt, no doubt. Let me put up some stuff for the brothers and sisters. I want to shout out the um hold on. Perceptions of a misplaced. Perceptions of a misplaced African. I think that's it right there. And then let me go on to Ed Enemy Productions. Some stuff. Da, 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 da. Let me go to shop now. So I want to shout out the um, the chat room really fast. Um, I see that we had had a lot of folks kind of dash in and dash out um, of the chat room. A lot of folks dashed in and dashed out. So let me go through and look really fast. I see that we had the Radical Home Goddess with us today. Thank you, sis, for coming through. Sister Rochelle Cody, thank you for coming through. Sister Chanisa Brown, thank you, sis, for joining us. Um, Brother Garfield Reed, he said, where's Riziki, LOL? <laughs> Brother Garfield Reed was in the building. Um, oh, he left a lot of funny comments that I'm just reading. Shout out to the Dag Squad, Brother Garfield Reed. Um, da, 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 da. Dilla Briggs, thank you, sister, for joining us. Um, uh, sister Anisha Green, thank you so much. For um for joining us, sister, you're, you're like there every Wednesday, and so we I want to thank you for joining us. Um, looking through the comments, brother Doug, brother Doug, that's my bro. I love that brother so much. He's a huge advocate of the sisterhood. He's always there. And look, when we don't have the show, he'll inbox me, Dr. Mayotte. Did I miss something? You know, what's what's going on with the show? I haven't, you know, I haven't seen anything, and you know, and I had to apologize and say, brother Doug, you know, my fault. I got caught up with this. So he looks forward to the tea talks with the sisterhood and, you know, he, he's there, he's moderating a beautiful brother and, and a huge supporter. So thank you, brother Doug, for joining us as always. Um, let me see who else. Minister Saw, thank you, brother, for tuning in and hopefully you'll tune in next week. I'll shoot you the link um, to join the panel next week. Uh, let me see who else. See who else? Ba, 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 ba. Brother Calvin McDougall. Brother Calvin McDougall. Thank you, brother, for joining us. Kiki with it. Thank you for joining us. See who else? Black Conscious Fraud Committee. <laughs> Black Conscious Fraud Committee. Thank you for joining us, brother. I think I saw Mac. I think his name is Mac. Oh, brother Jehudi Ma'at. Peace, brother. Thank you for joining us. Brother Mac Tip, thank you, brother, for joining us. And I think that was it. I'm looking down. I'm looking, looking, looking. I don't see any other names. I see MJA2873. Thank you for joining us. He said, great show. Peace. Thank you for joining us. And before you guys jet out, because I know as soon as you start closing out, people start clicking off the button. People start clicking the video off. Before you click off, please support the works of the sisterhood. Okay, we had Sister Alima on the show. She's here uh, practically every Wednesday, you know, giving input and just building. She has perceptions of a misplaced African. I have the book in my household and I've read it. I've shown you guys plenty of times. I'm not asking you to buy a product that I don't carry myself. It's a phenomenal book. It's, it's very deep. Please go to Amazon, click on the button, and support the sisters. Yes. Support the works of the sisterhood. And she's not asking a million dollars for her product. $7.99 for the Kindle, $20 for the paperback. And they even have some new ones on sale for $16. Support the sisterhood. Support the works of the sisterhood. Um. You have Meltrek. I believe that, you know, I said earlier that we have 16.4 million African-American household, households in the USA. All households should have 
Meltrek. Meltrek is a animated series that is dedicated to teaching children African history from an African perspective. So we talk about solutions. I, I mean, our people kill me. What are the solutions? What are the solutions? Well, you have brothers and sisters that are coming with viable solutions. You have to support it. Support the works of the brothers and sisters. Meltrek episode one is available. Meltrek episode one, exploring ancient Africa. We're teaching children. We're teaching the world that our history does not begin with the Ma'afa. Our history begins with civilization, thriving civilizations in Africa. After African people are the mothers and fathers of civilization. And we teach your child that in Meltrek. And we talk about how black people, how black Africans built the pyramids, how we gave architecture, religion, mathematics, and science to the world. So we teach our babies that we are, we were, and still are major world contributors prior to the era of enslavement. That's what we're teaching in Meltrek episode one. So all children, all families, all households should have Meltrek in their collection. Meltrek episode two, exploring the pre-Columbian Americas, teaches children that there was an African presence in the Americas prior to Christopher Columbus. No, we're not saying that we were the Omex, Mayans, and Aztecs and Incas. We're not making that claim. But we are making that claim that Africans did sail to the Americas prior to Columbus. So we talk about Abu Bakr, some people call him Abu Bakari, and his journey to the Americas. You know, a lot of it initially was speculation, but you have Malian scholars, and I had their work sitting in my library. But you have Malian scholars that are saying, yes, he made it to the Americas. And in fact, he made it to what we call Brazil, you know, in 1312. So we were already here. Then you had Africans like Alonso de Ilicus who established a province in Ecuador, 53. You know, and this is during the African diaspora. You had Africans who established the Maroon communities in South America and in Mesoamerica. You had that. And we teach our babies about that in Meltrek episode two. We also go into the out of Africa theory and we teach them that everything, everybody came from Africa and migrated to different parts of the world. We teach them the geography of North America, South America, and Mesoamerica. You can literally freeze or pause the scene and have your child study the facts, you know, on the scene or study, you know, the geography on this on on the screen. I'm telling you, it's an awesome product. Please visit edanimeproductions.com to purchase these products um, as soon as you can. So I have nothing left, um, Sister Alima, Sister Cheryl. The, uh, do you guys have anything left to say? If you're in the Atlanta area, be sure to check out the No Pseudo Tour. It's going to be at the Sandy Springs Library, 395 Mount Burning Highway, Sandy Springs, Georgia. I don't want to miss it. I'm getting ready Flyer up. Let me bring the flyer up. I want to show the flyer on your page. It's a flyer on your page. Yep. Let me bring that up. Because you just posted it. I'm coming hang out with the I'm in Ross squad. Yeah, we're going to get us something to eat when, we, when I get there, Monique. Okay, I'll make sure I don't. <laughs> I still, I gotta get yeah, I was about to say she'll have us on the truck again. That truck was good though. It was good, wasn't it? Yeah. Terrified, yeah. Cheryl. Terrified. Don't even worry, Sister Lima. You should drive down, Sarah. We about equal distance away. Down. Yeah, I thought we will come down. When is? Oh, it's on the. Saturday. It's Saturday. Oh, it's this Saturday. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is the flyer. This is the flyer right here. Um, if you guys can see it, Knowledge Development Ashe Group. Presents the No Pseudo Tour, Sandy Springs Library, 39395 Mount Vernon Highway, right here, Saturday, May the 13th from 10 a.m. And look at the topics, African spirituality, evolution, real black atheism, aliens in Egypt, hieroglyphics deciphered, uh, African linguistics and more. So please come out and support. Oops, what did I do? I did something. There it is. So please come out and support the No Pseudo Tour if you guys are in the Atlanta area. I'll get there. 
Yeah, I don't have anything else, sisters. I see people are clicking off. You know, people, <laughs> they dwindling. Thanks, yeah. The viewership is dwindling right now. As soon as you start saying you want to close out, everybody start clicking the, the X of button. Course. Yeah, so peace and power, family. We'll catch you next week. Peace and love. Peace, peace. and love.